an educational forum put on by the League of Women Voters of Greater Cook County. And um, I am going to make some, some uh, couple of announcements and describe us before our vice president in charge of the program and Marina McGowan will, will introduce the speakers. First of all, I'd like you to know those of you uh, who are interested, we are having a general meeting and it's on voter service and registration, the work they've done in that. It will be November 13th at 6.30 here. You are invited. I'd also like to announce that the League is selling poinsettias. And it, over there, you can consult with Millie Lensling. She has the copies of these. They're a bargain, and you can buy them in quantity if you like. Um, in general, uh, we are a very young league. We're just celebrating a year of existence. We've been recognized. <laughs> We've been recognized state and nationally. Uh, so we are official, chugging along. And um, the League of Women Voters grew from the suffrage movement. We coincide with the date of the 19th Amendment which gave us the right to vote. And so we will be celebrating our 100th anniversary, 2020, in 2020. Um, we are strictly nonpartisan, absolutely nonpartisan, but we are very political. And gerrymandering is a very political issue, as is voter ID. League of Women Voters has stood against gerrymandering by the Democrats, which occurred early on, and by the Republicans, which has occurred currently since the 1970s. We have also stood in opposition to voter ID. That was introduced in 2011 when Scott Walker took office, and the League held the line on that. They cast, the, they brought the first lawsuit in October of that year and got a favorable judgment and it was followed by a, a lawsuit by the ACLU and ultimately pursued other lawsuits to delay, delay, but it was enacted and pushed forth in 2015. For four years, the president of the League of Women Voters of Dane County waited raised hundreds of thousands of dollars so that the League could um, resist that. Okay, um, now with that, I would like to introduce you to your host, if Anna McClellan, and she will carry it on from here. Yeah, and thank you all for coming out to talk about this really hot topic of gerrymandering. Um, Microphone. <laughs> Does that work? I'm not using it. Oh, no. There. I'm going to turn it on. That works. Yeah. Um, this is a hot topic, and probably many of you know that there's um, ballot initiatives on, in four states. In the next couple weeks, people are going to be voting on it. Um, Ohio had a vote in May, and Pennsylvania is dealing with their um, Supreme Court changes. So it's big and it's happening in different states. And as you know, it's uh, been a big concern in Wisconsin. We'll hear more about that from our speakers uh, momentarily. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming out and uh, participating in the league. And it's I just want to take a second and say that it was like a short 18 months ago, I was sitting out there in the audience that came to my first league event. And it was on gerrymandering. And I learned a lot. and. Um, it's really took me in and I joined the league and have been hanging out with some really wonderful people and I've learned a lot and we have wonderful study groups so um, feel free to check us out on our Facebook page and look for events and join us. Um, it's, uh, you won't be sorry if you do. So I will introduce our speakers so you can. The topic is redistricting and fair election forum. Um, Professor Zim Zagorski, is, Kim will be talking to us first and giving us a little background on gerrymandering and bringing us all up to speed.
Kim is, um, this is outdated. She is the uh, chair for the Department of Social Science and <coughs> associate professor for political science. And Matt Rothschild, the executive director from Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, is joining us to give us a good update on what is happening in Wisconsin in regards to gerrymandering. So I will just turn it over to Kim and let her get started. Um, and then what Matt will speak, and then after that, we'll just open the floor to questions and answers. Senators, 
I moved away and came back after 2000, and I had to relearn uh, that we have eight house reps and two senators. Now, in that case, you have to totally redraw your boundaries. But as after happened in 2010, we lost population, but we didn't lose a seat. But populations within different um, states change around as well. So you have to redraw your borders. And you may ask, well, how does this impact Wisconsin? Well, if we look at most states, they uh, are, are structured the same way the federal government is. Or we could say the federal government is restructured the same way as states. And so if we look at representation in state legislatures, we find the same thing, that you have to periodically redraw your borders in order to reflect population shifts. And as part of the Constitution, states uh, are the ones that really are in control of elections, be it uh, our, our legislative elections for the State Assembly and the State Senate, but also congressional elections as well. So our con congressional um, boundaries are also drawn by the state legislature. <coughs> All well and good, we have the ratification of the Constitution, we get political parties, and someone realizes, hey, we can draw boundaries to achieve specific political outcomes, and we can get to Massachusetts. So some of you may recognize this political cartoon. In the early 1800s, Massachusetts Governor Elkridge Gary, a Federalist. So back at this time, our political parties were the Federalists and the Republican, Democratic Republicans. And Aldridge was a Federalist, and he realized he could redraw some of the districts for the Massachusetts State Senate and get Federalists in charge. Well, people, including political cartoonists, got in on the issue and, and, and really protested, and that's where we get the term gerrymander. After all of the uh, redistricting, so if you can see it, you've got the, the head of the gerrymander and the wings to uh, coincide with all of the different <coughs> boundaries. And we're off to races. A little bit of a change in the 1960s, uh, there is a Supreme Court case that says if you look at districts, uh, especially congressional districts, they have to be roughly equal in size with population. But when we start adding in the Civil Rights Movement, the Voting Rights Act, there's also that question, can we use redistricting for positive benefits, in this case, increasing minority representation in government? And the courts have thus far uh, mostly upheld what are called majority-minority districts, where you have the uh, creation of very gerrymandered districts uh, to produce um, outcomes where candidates who are racial or ethnic minority are able to have representation. Now, political scientists have debated about whether this is truly effective. Uh, are we diluting the vote? Are we uh, increasing representation? There have been some Supreme Court opinions that have called into question if this is constitutional or not. Um, and then, beyond majority-minority districts, we also have good old-fashioned gerrymandering, and the rest of that didn't come out very well. Um, so there's two different districts here, and I picked them largely because of their shapes and their names. I pulled this off the Washington Post website. Seventh, Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District, which is um, called Goofy Kicking Donald Duck. <laughs> Some people call it uh, a roadrunner, uh, a coyote and roadrunner. Uh, but you can see the really small bits connecting here. This is a, you know, a street. Um, over here in Illinois, 4th District, you've got a highway. Um, take that out. You have two geographically distinct uh, types of districts. And, and again, and to get specific outcomes. Uh, the majority minority district, this is North Carolina's 12th congressional district also added in there as one of the most gerrymandered uh, districts at the state or at the uh, federal level. 
So how did we get here in Wisconsin? Well, 2010, two things happened. The first, we have the national census to figure out how many people are in Wisconsin. And we also have the uh, Tea Party wave within the U.S. And in Wisconsin, like many other states, we had Republicans taking control of the governorship and the legislature. Per Wisconsin law, the party that's in control of the legislature at that time is also the party that sets the boundaries to correspond with the new census data. And that's what happened. Now, part, political parties will uh, uh, act to achieve their own goals, which is influencing policy outcomes. And it's expected, given what happened back in Massachusetts in the early 1800s, that we would expect drawings um, and districting to guarantee specific seats and, and advantage one party over the other. In this case, the question <coughs> is, did the Republican Party go too far? And uh, the, the answer amongst many people is that yes. Not only did the Republicans give themselves an advantage, but an outside advantage when it comes to uh, the electoral outcomes. This is some analysis done by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and this represents the state assembly districts under the redistricting plan from 2000, and this is the redraw districts uh, after 2010 that were enacted in 2011. And in both elections, you have relatively equal numbers of outcomes between Republican and Democratic votes overall, but you start seeing very distinct differences in um, outcomes. In the political science language, what we would say is how many votes are translated into seats. Um, under the type of electoral system we have, called a plurality type of system, it's quite common to see the uh, party that has the majority of vote getting a little bit higher of a proportion of a seat. That's just the effects of the type of system that we have. But with this type of redrawing, what we find is that um, the effects were, were far outsized uh, given what we would expect from those votes turnout. That the Republicans should have gotten more, but certainly not to the extent that they had. Um, and there's Eau Claire. <laughs> um, given given you know, what we had in 2004 and Eau Claire, um, I'm from the, I grew up in southeastern Wisconsin, so we can look at, at southeastern Wisconsin before and, and after. I know Matt has some um, uh, looking at some Senate districts as well to see how this has changed. And this, so this has led to um, a lawsuit um, named uh, called Gill versus Whitford, which argued that this extent of gerrymandering is unconstitutional. Now, when things go through the courts, and as I tell my students, there's a lot of different ways you can influence policy and how policy can be changed and implementation. One is the court system, and the court system takes a while. So the case is launched in about two, 2000, or, excuse me, 2015, and the court ruling came just a few months ago by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court pretty much said, we can't rule on this. That the plaintiffs, the people bringing the cases, didn't have what they call standing, or reason, to bring this case because they couldn't show that they had direct harm from these gerrymandered districts and kicked it down to the lower courts. And so the case is being reheard um, and more individuals are being brought in. And it may take time. This is the courts. The courts take a lot of time to work. So I'm going to end by saying what can we do while we're waiting for the court process. Something to remember though, change takes not only political will, but public support. Study of political politics and political science shows us that people and groups in power are not really willing to cha make changes if that outcome is going to diminish their access to power. And certainly in Wisconsin, if we 
change the redistricting laws, both parties are hurt. Certainly, you know, circa 2018, the Republicans more than the Democrats, but we still have both parties losing that ability for power, so the political stakes are high. But at some level, we also exist within a democracy, and representatives are supposed to uh, listen to the people's needs. So if we have a voice, and we show that this is something we want to do, it doesn't take the political risks away. Certainly, the state legislature can say, no, we're not going to take up that topic, but it makes the stakes easier for people that are willing to make that move and say, maybe we should make a change. And what types of changes? Well, we can look at Arizona and California and other states where they have um, independent groups, nonpartisan groups going out and drawing those districts. Uh, some places have legislative committees with citizen representation to take some of that sting and that partisanship away. And so you have that chance for a more equitable type of redrawing. There's also something called the Iowa Plan, and Matt's going to be talking more about that. So Matt, I will turn it over to you. You want to see the shadow of my curly hair there all the time, so I'll, I'll just go over. Well, anyways, good evening. Thanks for coming. I want to thank Anne Marie. For, it's great to be on a panel with Kim. Uh, students, I, some of our students I met today had a lot of fun over at Stout uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's great to see Wendy Sue Johnson here, one of the plaintiffs in the big lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court and was going back to federal court. So it's crazy. <laughs> Thankfully, there's no tornado warning tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm really impressed by uh, this. Uh, the interest in this issue tonight and actually uh, over the last year and a half. I've seen the interest in redistricting just mushroom here in Wisconsin and across the country. I think people are sick and tired of political game playing by whichever party it is. They want a fairer system. They've noticed that the rigging of the maps is bad no matter which party is doing it. And they want the system to change. They want a fairer democracy. And I'm the executive director of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. We've been around since 1995. We track and expose money in politics, especially in Wisconsin. We advocate for a more well-functioning and equitable democracy where everybody actually has an equal say in who the candidates are and what the laws are and what the policies are. We're not there yet. We need to get there. So one of the ways to get there is to have a fairer map. Now, uh, we want to ban gerrymandering in Wisconsin. That's our goal, the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. The League of Women Voters also shares that goal. Common Cause shares that goal. There are a lot of progressive nonprofits in Wisconsin working on this effort to ban gerrymandering in Wisconsin. And the issue of fair maps, as we like to call it, is a democracy issue in two ways. The first way is a procedural. The first part is a procedural question. Are the maps drawn in a democratic way? Are they drawn with a process that's open and transparent and uh, the public has input. And it wasn't true in 2011 the way these maps were drawn. Now what happened in 2011 was the legislative leaders, rather than drawing the maps uh, in the state capitol with a lot of public hearings and a lot of public input, actually they got out of the capitol, went across the street to the glass bank on the square in Madison, into the cushy law offices of Michael Best and Friedrich, a conservative law firm, and they drew the maps in a room that became known as the map room. And it was a lock map room. Uh, they hired a, uh, a scholar and demographer who knew how to monkey around with his computer and move a line here and move a line there to uh, uh, predict that by moving lines here and there, taking into consideration the political leanings of the people in those districts as lines he was moving, that they'd be able to predict a greater percentage of Republicans being elected, even with the same number of people voting, the same, you know, Democrat and Republican. And so they, they came through with uh, eight or nine different incarnations of maps, what was called uh, map number one, and then aggressive map number two, and aggressive map number three, and aggressive map number four, all the way to aggressive map number nine. And I think they took either aggressive map eight or aggressive map nine, the most aggressive maps, and they ran them through the legislature in 10 days barely had any time for the public to marshal any opposition to it whatsoever. Uh, and 
The amazing thing about the way they drew the maps in, in that map lock, uh, locked map room was you weren't invited into the uh, locked map room. The public wasn't involved. The media wasn't uh, asked in. Democrats surely weren't invited into the locked map room. Even Republican legislators who weren't in leadership weren't allowed to see their maps or go into the locked map room unless they got permission from two aides to the speaker, young men in their 20s who held the keys to the locked map room. And once, if you were a Republican legislator not in leadership and you got permission from these young men to go into the locked map room to see your own redistricted district, uh, you could only look at that, you could only look at this whole statewide map, and then before you could leave the locked map room you had to sign an oath of secrecy. Now that's not how the public's business should be done. So the process by which it was drawn was uh, undemocratic small d. And then the substance of how it was drawn was uh, very anti-democratic, uh, just a scheme, a scheme to advance Republican interests. And I brought a couple of uh, visual aids. This one is, is kind of like Kim's hypothetical, uh, where you see here you have 60 purple wards and 40 gray wards. You can draw it where there are three purple districts and zero gray districts. Or you could just grab a lot of the purple districts into one and then have two gray districts. So there are ways to draw it. But flip it over to this, this side. Because I think this really shows you how there were two ways they rigged the maps. One was by uh, cramming as many Democrats as possible into as small, as few districts as possible. So on the left we have uh, the old districts under the uh, 2000 to 2010 map. This is Racine and Kenosha, districts 21 and 22. Uh, and District 21 has Racine in it, District 22 has Kenosha in it. Those are Democratic cities, predominantly. And these were pretty much uh, competitive districts that leaned, both of them leaned purple. Both of them leaned actually blue. Uh, chances are Racine and Kenosha were going to be Democratic because of the population of their cities. Well, the Republicans really wanted to gain a seat in the same area, so what they did in 2011 was they pulled Racine and Kenosha cities together, framed all the Democrats into that slender district along Lake Michigan, and that left the outside area predominantly Republican and they gained a seat. That's how they gained a seat in Racine and Kenosha County. Rather than having two Democratic assembly seats, they had now one Republican and one Democratic. So that was one way they did it. The other way they did it was the opposite. They would disperse <laughs> Democrats. This is a little harder to see, but it's worth trying to look at. So here was in 2009, I'm looking at in the, in the lower right-hand corner, District 26, Sheboygan. Sheboygan, in Sheboygan County, the city of Sheboygan, tends to be Democratic. And they had a small district that really encompassed just most of Sheboygan and a little bit of Kohler there. And that would be a, a Democratic seat. Well. What the Republicans did was they redistricted on this one, and rather having a small bit of Sheboygan as one district alone, they put a lot of conservatives in the south here, south part of this orange district, in with Sheboygan, so they would tilt the district Republican. And it succeeded. District uh, 26 was held by a Democrat by 8,000 votes in 2008, and then in 2012, the Republicans won it with about 800 votes. So they were able to flip it the way they wanted to. So that is how they schemed the maps. And there is a fundamental problem with uh, just monkeying with the maps like that. Uh, and it's just not fair. So the plaintiffs, including Wendy Sue, sued in federal court in Madison. I was there for a lot of the court case in the blue federal building in Madison. It was fascinating to see. Actually, there were two court cases going on at the same time in the same building. The redistricting one was on one floor, and the floor above was a voter ID lawsuit. And I would go up and down the staircase. If I was bored in one case, I'd go down to the other. Fortunately, the, the uh, lawyers for the good guys, for the plaintiffs in this redistricting case, were tremendous. Uh, they produced all this evidence about the rigging. They saw the maps that the Republicans drew. They had all sorts of evidence, including this email from none other than Leah Buchmeier, it's on the back of this sheet, 
telling the people who were drawing the maps, including Tad, Tad Olman was one of the guys who had the keys to the locked map room, he was one of the speaker's aides, telling them how they could rig a district and get more Republican representation by rigging it. In fact, which tiny little pieces of the district they should move around. And so uh, the intent to rig the map in favor of Republicans was blatantly clear at, uh, at trial. And the fact that uh, uh, these, these aides, though, who testified, they actually lied on the stand, which was quite extraordinary for me, uh, because I come from a family of lawyers and was grew up told that you know people tell the truth in the courtroom. Evidently, that's not the case. Uh, it wasn't the case here, because these two staffers, they were asked on the stand, what was the purpose of all these aggressive maps one after another? Weren't they to predict that you have a greater Republican majority if you implemented the maps? And the kids said, no, there was no predictive value whatsoever to the maps. Well, the judges, uh, the judges ruled in favor of the plaintiffs two to one, but all three of the judges said in their decisions that that testimony uh, did not have any credibility to it. So anyway, they lied. People lie on the stand, I guess. So it goes. But uh, the intent was, was quite clear. And so uh, the two of the three judges ruled in a majority ruling that in the first time ever, actually, that this was an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander. The state appealed. The state has spent more than $2 million appealing their rigged maps. Uh, they appealed. They went to the U.S. Supreme Court. As Kim said, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on this in June, and they bumped it, basically. They sent it back down to the federal court. Uh, and they sent it down to the federal court saying uh, some of the plaintiffs, not all the plaintiffs demonstrated that they had standing or that they suffered particular harm in their particular district. And the argument the plaintiffs had been making was that their votes were being diluted. But some of the plaintiffs, including the chief plaintiff Whitford, Bill Whitford, and I'm going up to Merrill on Monday with Bill Whitford for a panel just like this. Uh, he lives in Madison. It was hard for him to argue that his vote was diluted because he chose to live in Madison anyway. It was a highly democratic district. How was his vote? Diluted. That's what the justices were saying. All unanimously said, uh, "We can't rule on this case because you haven't demonstrated harm." The one of the interest, two interesting things about the decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. One is, Chief Justice Roberts could have thrown the whole sucker out. He had enough votes in his hand to say, "You guys didn't show standing. Get lost. Never come back." And and the case here in Wisconsin would be dead. He decided not to. I'm not sure why. Maybe he wanted to get a unanimous ruling one way or another and keep the liberals on. Sometimes he tries to balance the court. Uh, he said this is an anomalous case. There are interesting arguments that haven't been adjudicated before. We need a better uh, evidentiary base to make a ruling, so we're going to send it back. And so there's some hope on the plaintiff's part that even with the new appointees to the U.S. Supreme Court and Anthony Kennedy gone, who they were shooting for, they were trying to convince, uh, that maybe Justice Roberts will come around uh, next time it goes up. The other interesting thing that happened at the U.S. Supreme Court in the decision was that Justice Roberta Kagan offered a new argument, a new argument for the plaintiffs. She was instructing them how to make a better case for themselves. And it was kind of fascinating to hear. And she was saying, you know, you made all this case about vote dilution. You're being cracked or packed or whatever, jammed into one district, your vote's getting diluted. That's a First Amendment freedom of speech argument that your speech is being muffled. And uh, you, there's a better argument to be made, and you don't even have to make this argument, this following argument, on the basis of your individual district. You can actually, she said, make a statewide argument demonstrating statewide suffering to all of you, not on a First Amendment freedom of speech basis, but on a First Amendment freedom of association basis. By the fact that you are all members of a political party, and your ability to operate uh, as a political party is being damaged by the rigging of the maps. I want to read you her exact quote. It's pretty interesting. Members of the disfavored party in the state are deprived of their natural political strength by a partisan gerrymander. So they may face difficulties fundraising, registering voters, attracting volunteers, generating support from independents, and recruiting candidates to run for office, not to mention eventually accomplishing their policy objectives. Well, the lawyers for the plaintiffs, when they read that dissenting opinion, they're, they're not stupid. They're really good lawyers. And so in this new filing that they made, they took her language word for word and said, we're being penalized in all these following ways, as she enumerated them. And so it'll be interesting to see how the federal uh, district court rules on that. But uh, I do want to be frank with you. I don't have tremendous hope 
that the U.S. Supreme Court, even if the good guys win at the federal district level, it's going to be heard on April 2nd, by the way, in Madison. I hope to be there again. Uh, I don't have great hope that uh, upon appeal, because whichever side loses is going to appeal again to the U.S. Supreme Court, that the good guys are going to win on this uh, because of the composition of the court, frankly. But we can solve this problem in Wisconsin of gerrymandering, of unfair rigging of the maps, simply by changing the law here. We don't have to wait for a U.S. Supreme Court case. And that's why uh, Common Cause and the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign and other groups, including the League, have been urging candidates who are running for office to pledge to be for fair maps, for a fair process of drawing the maps. And the procedure that we favor, and the League favors, and Common Cause favors, is, as Kim suggests, is the Iowa model. You know, they solved this problem in Iowa 40 years ago. Uh, and it works well in Iowa. If it works well there, it can work well here. Here's the model. Instead of having a political party in power draw the maps and be able to uh, you know, rig the maps so they stay in power for a whole 10 years, uh, they have career civil servants in Iowa drawing the maps with very specific criteria that forbids them from using political demographic data to draw maps. And you can't draw funky shape maps either in Iowa. And so uh, they've been happy with it in Iowa, even when Republicans have gained total control or when Democrats have gained total control. Uh, they haven't messed with that reform that they passed four decades ago in Iowa. So we're promoting the Iowa model. And the good news here in Wisconsin is there is a huge mass movement for fair maps in Wisconsin. It's been growing and growing. Uh, I've been tabling at Farmer's Market. I've been noticing a huge increase in the interest in this and signing our petitions for fair maps. But even better than that, than that anecdotal evidence is this. 41 out of the 72 counties in Wisconsin have passed county board resolutions, including Chippewa County, saying we want fair maps in Wisconsin, we want to ban gerrymandering in Wisconsin. And they sent a letter to the legislature saying, uh, you guys, pay attention here, we want you, the people of our county, want you to ban gerrymandering in Wisconsin. And so that's very exciting to me. I mean, there aren't, you know, 41 blue counties in Wisconsin, Lord knows. This is a bipartisan issue, an issue that crosses ideological grounds. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, progressive or conservative, you don't want the rigging of the maps if you're a decent, fair person. There are a lot of decent, fair persons on the other side, by the way, and we need to talk to them and, and uh, have conversation and argument, decent civil argument with people who don't agree with us but who aren't flying Nazi flags or Confederate flags. It's probably not a good use of your time to talk to them right now. But uh, Coming up, uh, also two... two uh, uh, counties have passed referendums themselves that the people have passed in Dane and Outagamie counties. And on November 6th, four counties have such referendums on their ballots, including Eau Claire County and Lincoln County, where I'm going to be in Merrill, and Sauk and Winnebago County. So on this issue of fair maps, I'm very confident that the people of Wisconsin are with us. It's one of the reasons I'm hopeful right now in Wisconsin. And I love this old quote by Fighting Bob LaFave. You know, I was the editor and publisher of the Progressive Magazine for most of 32 years that I worked there. And Fighting Bob LaFave was the founder of the Progressive and leader of the Progressive Movement, the great senator and governor from the state. And he always said that the cure for the ills of democracy, the cure is more democracy. And we need more democracy in Wisconsin, and getting us fair maps is one way to help get us there. Thanks very much, and we'll take questions.
There's also another issue that I didn't bring up, which is uh, that reminds me of is called prison gerrymandering, and this is a democracy issue too. If you uh, grew up in Milwaukee and uh, you live in Milwaukee and you committed a crime, and you're uh, you're convicted of the crime and you're set up to uh, sent up to Wapan, you're counted as living in Wapan and not living in Milwaukee, and then Wapan has more of a population and gets more representation than Milwaukee does, and then more resources from the government. So that goes by the name of prison gerrymandering, and it's a troubling topic too. Is that true of students, uh, university students? I think that depends where they. I don't know how they choose how they view students. Um, I think it depends on the census or census. It's yeah. where they live when the census is taken on the even years, and so if they're living in. If they take it uh, in 2010, the students who are living in Madison will be counted as Madison, I assume. Um, I know some states have had referenda uh, to bring up the issue of, of gerrymandering in the state in Pennsylvania, I'm sure. But um, could you talk to that with respect to the census? Sure. I mean, the problem with referendums uh, here is that they're advisory. Referendums are advisory. They don't compel the legislature to do anything. You could have an advisory referendum, and there are a lot of advisory referendums coming up uh, on November 6th for legalizing marijuana or medical marijuana. There are advisory referendums, I think, in nine communities to say that that community wants to uh, be on record is in favor of overturning Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision in 2010. They want to amend the Constitution to say corporations aren't persons and money isn't speech. Uh, but referendums are not binding. Uh, the only time that the referendum matters is if you're amending the Constitution of Wisconsin. Uh, the law has to pass uh, two le uh, legislative sessions, and then it goes to the people, and the people have to approve it. That's the only time that a referendum is binding in Wisconsin. Could you elaborate on the uh, Iowa plan? So the Iowa model, and you can look this up uh, on the, the way Iowa does redistricting, they have career civil servants like our Legislative Reference Bureau, for instance. The uh, staffers of the Legislative Reference Bureau in Wisconsin would draw the maps, and the criteria in Iowa are you, know, you can't use political demographic data. You've got to have normal, uh, regular, square, rectangular, to the extent possible, square, rectangular shapes or natural boundaries with rivers and creeks, etc. Uh, and there are a couple other ones too. You can't. Uh, draw a district so that it, it, so that you have the resident of a, a politician's residence in one of those districts or another and intentionally place them in one of these new districts. You, you've got to be blind as to where the, the politicians live because sometimes the politicians want to uh, you know move their, move the district so that they're in a, another district uh, instead of moving their house for instance. So they, they move the borders and advantage themselves that way. So there are a lot of specific criteria that really will lead to nonpartisan, independent, fair drawing of the maps. If they didn't have those criteria spelled out, just giving it to career civil servants, you know, you could say, well, maybe they have biases or not. But the, the uh, establishing in the statute of specific criteria that make the map drawing objective is really what's uh, also beautiful about the Iowa model. I, I'm not sure I have all the details correct, but if I recall this correctly, in the last, sometime in the last year, a number of people contacted Kathy Bernier, who was in a position where she could have brought forth um, a bill to uh, address this gerrymandering. And she did not respond to anybody, and she did not. She refused to do this. Now, do I have that correct? That she didn't. That she refused to bring it forward. Yeah, Kathy Bernier was head of the elections uh, committee uh, in the assembly, and she. Uh, there was a bill uh, put forward. There was one in the state senate that Senator Hansen sponsored, and one in the assembly that Assemblyman Brunick had sponsored. And we all were clamoring, the good government groups like the League and Common Cause and Wisconsin Democracy campaign, clamoring for a public hearing. And she wouldn't give us a public hearing. 
while the legislature was in session. She conceded afterwards that she would have a, a, a public hearing after the whole con all after the session was over and people could come testify in front of her, but it was not it wasn't uh, very relevant because the session was already closed. And she has been very hostile to people coming up and talking to her and asking her to do this, that, or the other, as Wendy Sue could testify to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell your story on that? Sure. So I was on the Eau Claire School Board, and we had legislative sessions approximately <coughs> quarterly with Altoona and Chippewa and Eau Claire would meet with our local legislators, and we had been doing it for several years. And um, my, my last one, it turned out the last one, um, I had come back to fill a six-month vacancy, and I was talking, actually, to Patrick and Bolton, um, Representative and Senator, sitting across from me, and Dana Walks and Kathleen Vinehout were there, and Kathleen Vinehout writes these, these like monthly stories, and I was referring to the one that she had just written, um, comparing the national, uh, comparing Wisconsin to Minnesota, the same national economy, how they had made different choices about funding schools, and, and you know, they've run a surplus, and, and so I'm talking to the gentleman across the table and saying, don't you ever just stop and, and question what we might be doing wrong, um, you know, different choices you could make, because Minnesota's been able to fund their schools appropriately, and, and Kathy's sitting over here, one person away from me, and I hear her shuffling around, and I'm trying to ignore it, and finally she says, this isn't relevant. And I snapped my head, I said, this is exactly why we're here. We're here to talk about school funding, and the, the choices that you make on funding our schools. And she got up and walked towards the door, and. Kathy Duax, who is a very sweet, kind, calm Southern lady, um, who was also on the Eau Claire School Board um, when I was on, said, now, Kathy, let's all settle down and come back to the table. Even if we disagree, we can talk. And she said, I can't listen to this vile political commentary. And out she walked um, halfway through this meeting with elected officials and superintendents, you know? And, um, and <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the media kind of took off with it a little bit. And um, the next day, she tells the Chippewa Herald that talking to these people is worse than going to the dentist. Now, I don't want to disparage dentists or anything, but, um, <laughs> you know, like we're, we're not just, you know, some riffraff that was, you know, a, approached her. So this is the kind of attitude um, that I think Jerry Mandarin allows. Um, she had held a listening session kind of uh, late in the spring, and some progressive folks came and to that listening session, and there was quite a big turnout from what I understand, and uh, I wasn't able to be there, but I did see her social media post afterwards on Facebook that said, come on, conservatives, where were you? I had to sit and listen to these, you know, progressives um, complaining about, you know, all these issues, and, you know, so she's basically telling her social media um, followers that she shouldn't have to listen to the other side. And that's what gerrymandering does. And frankly, she's a big reason why I'm running for her seat. Unfortunately, um, she was afraid to run against me and decide to run for Senate. At least that's my version. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, that, I mean, I think it's a perfect example about how gerrymandering allows people to camp in their polls. And I think that we should have to talk to one another and come up with um, common sense compromise positions on lots of issues. I think if we fix gerrymandering and dark money, that we could fix everything else. And I think that's a good example of, uh, you know, there, I, I testify sometimes uh, at the Capitol, and there, I was shocked at the uh, lack of decorum on the part of the majority. Uh, they act like, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, they act like uh, they're high school bullies or in a high school clique, and they, they are disrespectful of people uh, on the other side. They're disrespectful of citizens who come and testify before them. They giggle or they mock or they uh, don't pay any attention to anyone who is uh, saying something that they don't agree with. And, and they, they have all the votes in their hands, and they have a majority, and so they can do whatever they want uh, most of the time. Uh, sometimes I'll testify, and I think I'll have an impact uh, uh, on the margins, and I think it's useful testifying anyway. But the attitude, because of the gerrymandered districts, because of the total uh, control of power in their hands, the attitude has been uh, very condescending and juvenile at the same time. 
to add on to that, uh, another impact of the gerrymandering bump, besides the the lack of decorum and the, the lack of discourse, is on voters as well. If you are in a gerrymandered district, and so have, hearing your elected official saying, well, you know, I don't represent you, what what inclination do you then have to enact, to engage in the political system? And um, I study more national politics than, than state politics, but at any given time in Congress, the House of Representatives is up for re-election every two years, so theoretically we could replace the entire House every two years, but it's less than 20% uh, of districts are competitive. And uh, so in, in my media and politics class this week, I showed a, a documentary by Michael Moore called Fights for Congress. Short, it's up on YouTube. It's from 2000. He ran a ficus plant uh, as a write-in candidate. And his logic behind it was people don't have choice. You have districts drawn so that one person gets in, and, and, and let's face it, unless it's a presidential election, a lot of information does not get out to voters. Um, and so um, once you get in, that name recognition does help. Um, but if you know that that same person is going to get in or that party is going to get in, why bother showing up? And that hurts at the local level, too. That hurts at the state level. If the, uh, most of the information you're getting from the national elections, it, and that tunes out, that has a knockdown effect as well. So I think if we get rid of the gerrymandering, we get fair, fair uh, districts, we get competitive elections, it may help um, broaden the discourse, but it might get more people in to vote as well. Is gerrymandering, a, is it occurring at the county level? Are there county boards? Well, you know, it's a and, funny. And who, who draws those lines? You know, it's a funny question. Uh, you know, does gerrymandering happen at the county level? Speaker Voss was saying to some of us in Madison when we were saying we need fair maps in Wisconsin. He says, "You guys will get fair maps when you when you do fair maps in Dane County." Well, we called his bluff, and Dane County is doing fair maps now. So they uh, have changed the way they do the districting there and are doing it in a more objective way. But uh, you can answer probably. This. Specific as to who draws the district. I believe it's a done county government. I, I gotta find out now. <laughs> I asked one of the it county is. board guys, and he was like, "Gosh, I don't know." It is. It is the county board. It is the county board that draws the maps for the county. Hmm. And they do take census districts into account, and they take into account uh, contiguity and geographical limits. So that it doesn't begin, at, the, at least in Dunn County, it doesn't begin, the gerrymandering doesn't begin there. It begins at the next level when you put those together. I mean, was, we have other problems, but, but uh, defining voting districts is not one of them. One point that I understand to be so that I don't hear enough about it is just the cost of taxpayer money. Even if it stayed the same way it is, and say the, next, the new party gets in power. Just the act of doing it of the representative's time, their staff, and everything it costs to do to make the process where this Iowa plan literally takes a few thousand dollars. I understand that to be true. Yeah, the Iowa plan is much cheaper uh, and more efficient, and then they, go, they have to go all around the state and do public hearings, uh, but it doesn't cost nearly what this thing has cost, and the lawsuit itself has cost upwards of two million dollars and, and the state hired some fancy lawyer who used to be solicitor general of the United States who was getting an ungodly amount of money per hour like twenty five hundred dollars or something per hour. Uh, it's nice work if you can get it. <laughs> Pick it up on what this lady just said. I too was thinking of that Iowa plan. It seems very commonsensical but I go back to what they did in 2010, and they met off the Capitol building, they met in a bank, a private room, and they did their own map making, very self-serving. And 11 days later, it was done. Now, we're trying to un and 
those people by no means were experts. They had an agenda. And now it's, I remember reading about this, this lawsuit coming up. I don't know, was it a year and a half ago when they first started talking about it? And it's still not done. And now it's going to another court. And you just mentioned it's going to go to appeals. It makes me ask the question, when these guys draw that map, shouldn't there be some sort, I know, I know you don't have the answer, but shouldn't there be some sort of a, a judicial review of whether or not they use the right criteria to make those boundaries? Well, there's, you know, judges have uh, intervened in the process when de neither Democrats nor Republicans in Wisconsin held both. Uh, the assembly and the senate, and the, on top of that, the governor's chair, because nobody could, they couldn't agree, and so in those instances, judges intervene and actually hire someone to draw maps that are more fair than uh, the way the political parties draw them. So that's happened in uh, 2000 here, for instance, in, in Wisconsin. Um, as far as right now, it's unless you change the law, there's going to be no judicial oversight. I mean, that's the simple answer to your question. And if we're going to change the law, we might as well get something like the Iowa model where we get a lot of criteria in there that will instruct the, the career civil servants about how to draw fair maps. Do you think we could get the Iowa model passed in Wisconsin? Well, I don't think we're going to get it today, not with the way things are constituted with uh, who's representing us, but I think this is going to, I think a lot of democracy reforms are going to happen over the next 10 or 15 years because I think the citizens of this country uh, no matter how they identify themselves, they understand the system being rigged. I mean, they understand in their gut that the system is rigged, that it's rigged by big money and dark money and elected officials playing games. And they're sick and tired of it. I mean, that's why you had two non-career politicians, uh, you know, uh, leading the pack last time. You had this entertainer and you had this Jewish socialist who'd never combed his hair in his life. And they were the most popular people in the country for a long time. And one of them was president. <laughs> Well, I'm just curious. Uh, as I understand it, the only way that Wisconsin can, can change the law is by actually passing it through the legislature. And the way that that, that happens is to go through what was formerly Kathy Vermeer's uh, election commission on the assembly side and at the Senate level, the same thing. And that isn't going to happen because the majority party, which in this case is the Republicans, hold the court and will not release, I don't care what proposals there are, what bills, they're not going to get out of committee. Not going to get a hearing. That's correct. So how do we go about it? Well, you need to elect people who, from either party, and there are, you know, there's a guy named Todd Novak in Dodge, well, who's a Republican, uh, who uh, is in favor of fair maps and also in favor of uh, uh, um, having campaign finance reform. There's a senator, Republican senator in Green Bay, the only Republican senator who voted against the horrible rewrite of our campaign finance law in November 2015, Rob Cole. So there are some Republicans who uh, understand and are willing to stick their neck out occasionally, uh, who understand how the system is rigged and want to change it too. So we just, we need to elect people who will pledge to uh, vote in favor of legislation for fair maps. But until the majority leader or the speaker of the assembly changes, because they're the people who control the Kathy Berniers of, of, our, uh, of our lives. I mean, if Kathy Bernier, even if she wanted to hold a hearing on fair maps, Robin Voss wanted to let her hold a hearing on fair maps. I mean, the, the leadership of the political party, especially on the Republican side, uh, is very controlled and controlling. And so the members do what the leadership says they can do. It's going to take, like Matt said, you know, another 10, 10 years or so, but part of it is putting that groundwork on keeping the issue at the forefront. It might not be something that's acted on, but if you keep talking about it, you keep building awareness about it, you start building coalitions um, across the aisle, you get allies. Uh, at some point, there's going to be a, a, a tipping balance, be it uh, Stephen Voss and, and Fitzgerald are elected out of office or decide to go for higher office. Um, you 
get um, enough support on the Republican side so that uh, they have to start negotiating on other, other issues that are more important and need support um, for trade-offs in order to get that legislation. It's not going to happen overnight. It's something that's going to have to take a while, but if we keep that issue going and we lay the groundwork and, and, and use the pro I hate to say use the process against them, but, but use that same process and that same knowledge that they're using to keep redistricting from happening, um, there is that possibility that it's it's going to happen. And candidates and candidates and elected officials need to hear from you. They need to hear from you that this is an important issue. Uh, Mike McCabe, who was running for governor in the primaries, came back and told our office, and he used to run the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, you know, politicians used to say no one brings up money in politics, they never hear about it, people don't care about it. Guess what? During the whole campaign and all the debates and public hearings we had, there were only three questions on, on campaign finance reform and money in politics. And if he hadn't brought it up, it almost never would have uh, been on politicians' minds. So we need to get the issue of money in politics and the issue of fair maps uh, on uh, politicians' minds. So when they're having uh, town hall meetings, uh, we as citizens need to go to the town hall meeting and say, are you going to be for fair maps or do you want to keep gerrymandering this and rigging the maps in this state? Uh, and just we need to raise the issue wherever we can. And if you have friends in the local media who you know are going to be on a panel or doing a debate with the candidates, you should ask them, why don't you ask them about fair maps or ask them about you know, amending the Constitution to get money out of politics or whatever issue is important for you from a democracy standpoint. We've got to make sure that that issue is in front of the candidates and the elected officials. Otherwise, they can't say, well, nobody cares about it. Even the polls show, even though the polls show that, you know, 80% of the public thinks there's too much money in politics and big business has too much influence in politics and that the maps are being rigged. I mean, how many counties do we need to get before elected officials in the state are going to say, if people want fair maps? I mean, we've got 41. Do we need 51, 61? Do we need 71 out of the 72 <laughs> counties before they decide? I mean, that, that gets a little bit crazy. And that gets to the point that, you know, how representative is our democracy right now? Our democracy, we're in a representational crisis right now. That the people we elect do not respond to us. They aren't representing us. They're representing their donors and a, a narrow ideological interest. And, and that's the problem. And while I'm on uh, the subject of ideology, we've been fed over the last four or five decades a very crude ideology that says everything public is bad and everything private is good. And we need to uh, uh, refute that ideology. I mean, you know, do you like your streets being plowed? Do you, you know, do you like your public parks? Do you like to go to the why losing State Park or Governor Dodd State Park or the State Park in Door County and you know there are public goods that we need to celebrate and we can't let uh, them denigrate the idea that we have something that we share as a public public lands public schools public libraries uh, otherwise the privatizers are going to win the day and the people who are anti-democratic small d are going to win the day this has been the agenda of the Koch brothers the Scape Foundation, the Mellon Foundation. It's all spelled out in the book Dark Money by Jane Mayer. And Charles Koch said last year, we've made more progress in the last five years than in the last 50 years. And so uh, they're gaining. They're gaining on that food ideology. I just want to say that not only do we have to keep the pressure on all of us, and more of us, and your neighbors, and your friends, and your family, and your relatives, and, and the people down the street from you, but we have to remember that we have the best government when neither party has total power. We do not need one party government in Wisconsin. We don't get the good ideas and the creative problem solving with one party. <coughs> we get much better government with two parties or even, even two parties and the libertarians because more ideas come in then. And I agree with that. I think we need, you know, we need to talk uh, across ideology with our friends and our neighbors and the people we exercise with or the people we go to the bar with or the people we worship with or the people we work with. Um, and that's one of the reasons I really want to salute the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. I go to a lot of events. I'm asked to go to speak to a lot of League of Women Voters chapters around the state. And I think uh, the League of Women Voters are doing more good than almost any other group, perhaps any other group in the state, in elevating the political discourse, 
educating citizens, doing the grassroots organizing that's necessary, and doing it locally. It's so important to do it locally. Uh, and I just applaud the League of Women Voters in each of your chapters. This chapter here, the Greater Chippewa Valley, I applaud the leadership in Madison. Andrea Kaminsky, the longtime leader who stepped down the last couple of years, was a tremendous model for the nonprofit progressive sector. And her uh, successor, Aaron Grunzi, is a tremendous leader as well. So the League is, uh, is really one of my favorite groups these days. I give them a tax uh, deductible contribution at the end of the year. And uh, uh, I think everybody should support the League. Support Wisconsin Democracy. <laughs> Forty-one counties, yes. That have in or something? No, forty-one county boards have passed resolutions saying that they are that the people of their county or this county board is in favor of fair maps in Wisconsin and in favor of banning gerrymandering in Wisconsin. They want the state legislature to change the law so that the redistricting process is done in a fair, nonpartisan, and transparent way. Well, it's a good question. Uh, more than three quarters of those counties have signed on in the last two years. This thing is really mushrooming now. It's really gaining momentum. Okay, so anybody on the board here better talk to your comments? How about that sound, you know? What about Don? What about the freezing this area? I think Don and Eau Claire has. I, uh, I have a map in my car. I should go out and get it. I'm going to go get it. Hold on. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a cool looking map. I meant to bring it. It's in the trunk of my car. I gotta get my keys. It's in the trunk of my car. I'll be right back. Oh, I got it. <laughs> Okay, while he's while he's waiting, uh, I know Wendy Sue, you are a representative. So is Barb Plum, who's right over your shoulder. Do you want to stand up, Barb? And Jane Peterson. Jane, are you here? She's not here. We got two lead members who are our participants in the suit. And Wendy Sue. Okay, well, um, more questions to add here. <clears throat> this might be kind of a boring question, but there's been um, models that have used statistical modeling to assess whether maps are fair or not. Um, what are the states that have been kind of now coming up as including some sort of mathematical model to help assess? Can you, can you comment on that? I, um, so I, I know the mathematical model was kind of that key in uh, the Wisconsin case because one of the things that Justice Kennedy had said was that having that case, or having that, having that proof, would be something that he had, had wanted. I haven't heard of it being on uh, ballots at all, but it's it's certainly depending on how the courts rule. Uh, that's probably something you might see more. More, uh, uh, so I came late for that question, but one of the neat things that the plaintiffs did in this lawsuit was they provided an objective yardstick, which is what Anthony Kennedy was asking for, and uh, they gave him one. And that's why it was so disappointing that, that uh, they weren't able to get Kennedy's vote on substance on this issue. But here's the map so you can see all the counties. <coughs> Well, that's what I was wondering. I mean, do we need all 72 of them? I mean, I would think we should be able to succeed. I mean, obviously there are not 41 blue counties in Wisconsin. A lot of these counties are not, look at Taylor and Clark and Jackson. Those are not Wood County. Those aren't exactly really blue places. And, and Forest County also. Lang Lake County, these are not blue places. But the people uh, in all over the state, as you can see, this is a wide distribution. All over the state, people uh, represented by their county board members want to see fair maps. Yeah, Grant County came on board. We did these, the ones that came on more recently, we just did with Magic Marker, but <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. Are there any white counties? Are there any roads that have 
no way? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I would think that the ones that are should be easiest from now, Columbia County and Iowa County, are, have a pretty liberal populations there. That should be kind of easy. Uh, I don't know about Waukesha County or Washington County or Ozaki. The Wow counties are the most conservative ones here in the southeast. Uh, Fond du Lac is a pretty conservative area. I was just spoke there last week. Um, Menominee, maybe. Uh, Wapaka County, I spoke there recently. That's pretty conservative territory as well. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I still, Washburn should be fairly easy too. I just think it's, uh, I just think because this crosses ideological lines, we should be able to pass this in almost every county. Is there language that is common in all these resolutions? There is language. I didn't bring it with me. I want to. Um, Put you to our website, point you to our website. Our website is WIS for Wisconsin, DC for Democracy Campaign, WISDC.org. And there on the home page at the top there's something that says reforms. If you click on that, you can get to redistricting. You click on that, you can find out a lot of this information, including the taxes. Because some of I mean, we have some members in Pierce County, we have members in Barron County that are part of the league. Uh, not a lot, but, but there's a template on any of those counties' websites and find the rest. Or we have it on our website, or you can send me an email. Anyone here can send me an email, and I will get you an answer. I'll get you text. The email is Rothschild, that's R O T H S, silent S in there. Rothschild, R O T H S, child, C H I L D. Rothschild at wisdc.org. And uh, we will get you the information you need. It sounds like you have gone on each one of these, and then. Well, no, no, the only time, that really doesn't happen on the redistricting thing. It has happened on another very hopeful sign in Wisconsin, which is 131 communities now on board for amending the Constitution to say corporations aren't persons and money isn't speech. Uh, that's something that uh, Chippewa County is on board with in the past, also a couple years ago. Um, but I often will go to groups like this and talk about that, and I will give out the person's name, and I'll do it right now if I can get my phone to start. Uh, the guy with Wisconsin United to Amend is doing most of the organizing on that issue. So when I speak to groups and give out his phone number, we've got some other communities to come on board that way. So sometimes I, I'm a scout and spy, but most of this work has just been done. You know how a lot of it started? Uh, the lawsuit brought a lot of attention to it, but there's a guy in Lincoln County named Hans Brayton Moser. He's one of our plaintiffs. He's one of your plaintiffs. I saw it in the I saw it in the refiling, and I'm going to be up talking with him uh, in Merrill on Monday. He called our office two years ago in January or February and said, "You know, this rigging of the maps really bothers me." He didn't really know much about it. He wanted information about it. He's a county board member in Lincoln County, and he said, "Can you give us some information? Give me some information. I want to." know more about it, I want to know how to get a, a resolution in, in the county. So the next day we wrote up some draft language for him, drafted or whereas resolution, etc. And uh, County Cause helped him with it too, and some other groups in our Fair Maps Coalition helped him with it as well, and he got it through Lincoln County. And bless his heart, he wasn't satisfied just getting it through Lincoln County. He said, well, we got it passed in Lincoln County, why can't we get other counties involved? So he was really one of the prime movers in the county by county organizing. And he also went to the Wisconsin Counties Association, the, uh, the gathering of all the counties that meet once a year down in Wisconsin Dells. And he told me, and he put forward a resolution at the Wisconsin Counties Association meeting and it passed there. So the Wisconsin Counties Association is on board for fair maps too. But if all of, you know, I think more than, once, more than anyone else in Wisconsin, uh, Hans Brighton Moser is responsible for county by county resolutions going through. They, were the first county. they weren't the first county. Some counties had already come on board, but he was he got it going. He, he pushed the momentum starting two years ago, and most of these counties have come on board just in the last two years. So um, to me, that's a story about an individual who's committed to pro democracy reform, who is an elected official, who made things happen. Largely by himself. Well, of course, we have a lot of people helping out in the progressive nonprofit community, but he took the bull by the horns and he, he wrestled with it, and boom, look at that map. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. So, how would you typically start that? Is it a petition drive or just working on your top board? I, I, 
finding a receptive county board member is probably the best way. Find a receptive county board member in your county uh, and get that county board member some of the sample legislation as you were suggesting the past in other counties and try to work from there. And it's then important to try to get someone who, uh, if you're a Democrat on that county board who is a Repub sensible, decent Republican who wants fair government and pro-democracy to come on board with you and then move it together. Any other questions? Thanks so much for coming. I have a question before the group leaves. I'm just curious. How many people here are younger than 55? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 45. So, how do we... so where, where are the rest of them? I tried. I gave my classes extra credit to come. I tried. I mean, that's really important, isn't it? It's important. Uh, do you want to say something? Well, he, he laid it out there. My, I mean, I am hopeful uh, because I work in a coalition called Wisconsin Voices, which is a coalition of 50 or so nonprofit, progressive nonprofits in Wisconsin. And a lot of them are led by and staffed by people who don't have my gray hair. Uh, or yours, if you don't mind me saying it. And, uh, you know, these people are millennials. They're very involved. They're super smart. They're super savvy. Uh, they know social media in a way I certainly don't. Uh, they know how to organize at the grassroots. A lot of them are doing work right now, registering people to vote, uh, uh, exciting people to vote making sure people have rides to the polls. And so, uh, I, you know, I go around the state, and this is the kind of crowd I, I attract. That might be my fault. But, uh, you know, I do think it is a problem of some progressive nonprofit groups that we tend to be really old, and we need to find a way to reproduce ourselves and to have panels that will attract younger people. Speaking of which, and speaking of getting young voters to get registered, uh, we're partnering with... Um, Stout Student Association and several other Stout groups trying to get some signage up to get students thinking about registering to vote. Really, you, 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 and you, and you, and the student, not just somebody off in the blue somewhere. And they need some money. Our league doesn't have any money yet, but this little box is for them. Please put some in. Signage. To tie on to that, um, part of it, I mean, I have students that um, will tell me in, in written feedback at the end of the semester that um, they don't want to uh, engage because one, they don't know how to, but also that they feel they don't know enough. So my mission is to try and get them to have the keys to the knowledge to, to know. But tying into all the messages that, that we've been, been fed for the past several decades, is one, compromise is a dirty word, um, but then also that all you need to do is go out and vote, not come to events like this, not have dialogue. Um, and so I think part of it is also just getting that message out that civic engagement isn't, voting is a key part of it, um, but that there's other ways and, 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 and your responsibility just doesn't end the moment you get your I voted sticker. I also just might want to add, and then I want, I'm sorry, I do want to hear what you have to say, but I do think, you know, if we find issues that have more natural attraction for a younger audience, like legalizing marijuana or uh, student, loan. student loan repudiation and free college education, that we may get a younger crowd. My, my question is for Kim. Uh, in, I don't know how long you've been teaching Um, I've, gosh. Um, I've been doing this um, since about the early or the late 90s. Okay. So th this question would be appropriate. In that time frame, what have you seen from the young, from the student age, okay, under 21, as far as concern for what's going on in the country? It goes in waves. There was a really big 
interest in, in, in uptick in around 2005, 2007, driving with, um, with Iraq, and then 2008 with Obama, and then you saw, and I think part of it was just a, a, a function of the Great Recession, went down. You saw, I saw a little blip in um, 2012, 2013. Um, you know, overall, I think there's a, it's, the level of basic knowledge, I think, has declined a bit. Um, and I think part of that is just the transition to electronic information um, and how much information you don't get. I mean, I am old enough to remember the time where you had three stations and after the late, late show you had the test pattern or snow until six or five or six in the morning. And so your levels of, your sources of political information, uh, even if you didn't want it, you were going to get something. There was just going to be some, some latent civic knowledge that was going to come through you through your interaction in everyday life with society or through um, normal going and looking at a paper. I mean, how many times do you see the paper and the above folded paper? Now there's so many ways to not be informed. And then you get the whole issue of fake news and am I reading what is credible? And I think part of it is the change in information technology and then the insecurity or the, the lack of certainty on how to access it. And then when I access it, what do I do with it? So I think it's changed. There was a lull, and, and, and I'm a Gen Xer. I'm, I'm the ultimate, part of the ultimate slacker generation, apparently. Um, but for all that um, millennials and, and, and the generation, I generation students get blasted, I think part of it is just that inability to, to to figure out what to do, how do I exist in here, how do I get these tools, and once I get them, um, having some of that willingness to, to do it. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think Bernie Sanders animated a lot of young people because he was talking about, uh, you know, real issues in, in real ways that affected them and that gave them a real vision of a, of a better, a more progressive America that they could uh, respond to, and once he got beat, uh, a lot of the steam went out. Uh, there were some young women who were animated by Hillary Clinton as well. I don't want to deny that. Uh, but uh, I do want to say for uh, the millennials that this is hopeful too. They're much more advanced than the rest of us on issues of racial equality and gender equality. They are much more suspicious of capitalism than the rest of us are. And uh, that gives me hope as well. Not all schools are teaching civics in the in the high school, and I, I think that's a concern. If if their kids aren't don't understand the system. Yeah. I think well, that's true. And Sandra Day O'Connor, I just want to give a shout out to her. You know, she was great on the U.S. Supreme Court, and when she retired, she did public civic education across the country. The Wisconsin Newspaper Association has just started a uh, new. Reaching out to the schools, the high schools, with their civics form. So, in my readership, again, I'm just out from the Sun Argus and Woodville Leader, uh, small weekly readers. And uh, so, we reached out to the three high schools in our area saying we would sponsor your civics bowl team. I contacted the principals who said, you know, This is the information. Uh, and this will be a good thing that, that uh, there's a curriculum that the teachers could pick up through the Wisconsin Newspaper Association. And then uh, there will be a final contest in Madison in January. And so there's an incentive that's prize and so forth. Nobody signed up for that? We haven't gotten a response yet. By the way, that was two weeks ago. <coughs> I think for Wisconsin, um, I don't know how soon it goes into effect, but I think to graduate from Wisconsin high schools, you have to pass a civics test. That's correct. Um, and so I don't know, uh, I, I, I grew up in the Milwaukee area, I, I remember having civics. I mean, bless the, 
the teacher who, who is there is long since gone. Um, but you know, my civics test was memorizing the first four moments to the Constitution. So, um, which is important, but is that going to give me that day-to-day -day activity? Um, and I think part of it, too, is um, civics, I don't think, is on any of those standardized tests that we have to do now with no child left behind. Um, and so it, it's part of that whole civic um, culture part that if that's not what we're valuing for education, we may not get, I hope, I mean, as a, as a political science educator, I hope um, that we get, that you get students. Um, it, in terms of uh, hope for the, the generation, one of my political science professors in grad school said, you know, you start paying attention to local politics uh, once you buy a house, and I'm like, yeah, 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 I bought a house. I pay attention to local politics a little bit more. So um, there are trends as people get older, as they um, become established, they do pay attention to the political system a little bit more. So there is hope for the, the younger generations. Well, it's very typical that nobody goes to the school board meetings until there's a crisis. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the room is packed. And before that, the room is packed. Oh, uh, Ralph Nader has always said that being a citizen is a full-time occupation, occupation. And we all know what the buildings are good for you are really good because they have other jobs. But it's full-time thinking about it. And it's full-time paying attention. And doing the things when you can. And going to meetings and meetings and meetings and weekends. So people have to be engaged. I'm at the age where I can see where the, the thing that upsets me the most is a lot of what brought us to where we are now is people have not been they have gotten slack. They just, you know, there's not some sexy new uh, issue out there. That they don't pay attention. They're not engaged. They're not critical enough. They don't speak out enough. They're afraid to speak their opinion. Not, not that I ever. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it comes down to an informed electorate. And I think other countries do way much better at that. More, people in other countries are so much more knowledgeable about their own power. And we're, I don't know if we're too materialistic and distracted or whatever, but citizens have got to be. I think it comes back to the. Sorry, no, no, it's the same. It comes back down to the corporate yeah, culture, so. Yeah, right. right. And this discussion, we could, uh, this is exciting to be talked about, and we could go on probably for the next hour. But I will invite you all to come. It's in November 13th, the voter services. Group will have a general meeting, and the voter service group is just going to give us a little PowerPoint presentation on all the groups they served. And you can see that they have been into the high schools, and that's a mission of our league is to get there and, and have the kids registered to vote. Uh, you know, have to do that every fourth trimester. At 6:30 here, it's a Tuesday, the 13th of November. One week and after the election. Yeah, and you know, these topics, if you have an, a, a specific topic that you would like to have a forum on, we would love to hear it. And we would, you know, this is our mission and we're all passionate about it. And we'd be more than happy to have, you know, forums and have yeah, tons of students people show up. Students, that is on our goal. Well, thank you for this forum. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much to yeah. Matt and to Kim Matt for rocking all the way up. Yeah.